This conference will now be recorded. This is the classical come to you origins of Pan-Africanism, uh, global Kemet, and we're also going to deal with the, the Kinga theory of come to you consciousness. So all of this is for the RBG Centennial uh, Conference. You see we're rocking the RBG all around, RBG flag all around, RBG behind us. So we are representing, and we're going to go ahead and represent this with the presentation. So I'll get ready to go ahead and share my screen. And we have a lot of ground to cover. I have 97 slides and I'm uh, where I have something like 30 minutes. So I'll try to make this as uh, quick but thorough as possible. And again, this is the classical Kometiu origins of Pan-Africanism and the Dikinga theory of Kometiu consciousness, global Kemet. Um, so the points to be covered, you know, we're going to deal with this, uh, this idea of did the concept of Pan-Africanism start in the 1500s through 1900s. We're going to deal with what actions our ancestors took to ensure that the land of Black people was protected from non-Blacks. We're going to deal with when the situation flipped and then also what should be done today. So Pan-African was linked to Blackness from its very inception. We see that the organized Pan-African movement uh, can be said to have begun with the founding of the African Association in London, 1897, and the subsequent convening in the same city of the first Pan-African Conference uh, three years later. After contacting Black people, uh, Nana Henry Sylvester Williams founded the African Association, whose membership was restricted to those of African descent, again, meaning Black people. But the situation flipped around mainly at the 1945 uh, Pan-African Congress, but we'll come back to this point. So according to Nachin Wezu in Pan-Africanism Revisited uh, Prologue of Critical and Neshmi-Centric History, he deals with the seven goals of the 1900 uh, Pan-African Conference. And the first one to promote unity, feeling, and friendly intercourse among the peoples of the Negro slash African race, to achieve self-rule with civil rights and responsible black governments from the colonized Negro countries. Three, to achieve voting rights, physical security, prosperity, progress, and justice for Africans abroad, and that is Negroes in the countries of the white race, <coughs> excuse me. Four, to promote the business interests of Africans abroad, African people living in the countries of the whites. Five, to create a great central Negro state in Africa for the black race. Six, to secure integrity and independence for the self-governing Negro countries, Ethiopia, Haiti, Liberia, and any others that emerge, and seven, to earn for the Negro race equality with and respect of the other races of humanity, right? Um, and you can get these points from the Address to the Nations of the World by the Pan-African Conference in London, 1900. And it mentions that the nations of the world respect the integrity, independence of the first Negro states of Abyssinia, Liberia, Haiti, and the rest, and that the inhabitants of these states, the independent tribes of Africa, the Negroes of the West Indies, and the black subjects of all nations take her. So again, you can see that they're referring to Africa, Negro, Black as interchangeable, right? Here again, it talks about letting the British nation give as soon as practical um, the rights of responsible government to the black countries of Africa and the West Indies. So they don't say any country, they don't say the Arab countries, are uh, Arab dominated countries and what's now known as Africa. They're only talking about the black colonies of Africa and the West Indies. So we see that Pan-Africanism was conceived by and for black people regardless of location, rather than for Arab and slavers, regardless of whether or not they're indigenous, African equals black people, or Eurasian invaders, and slavers and continued colonizers of African land. So we continue again, 1900 uh, conference, they mentioned let the great let the Congo Free State become a great central Negro state of the world, and that is prosperity counting not simply in cash and commerce, but in the happiness and true advancement of its Black people. Again, referring to the Black people, not talking about the uh, Belgians who are there, not talking about anybody else but the Black people. So the null hypothesis is that Pan-Africanism is often regarded as a modern phenomenon and a direct response to colonialism, neo-colonialism, and enslavement, neo-enslavement. It's usually associated with the coining of the term Pan-Africanism in English, 
or retroactively apply to those immediately preceding the coinage. It's tied to Nana Henry Sylvester Williams and the first Pan-African Conference organized to protect and promote the interests of people of African blood or descent. Now, in terms of dealing with the impetus for unity, according to Nana Walter Rodney, worth quoting at length, and speaking with specific reference to modern Pan-Africanism, he talks about the first area of the world to which Africans were taken uh, to labor as slaves, quote unquote, uh, and then immediately thereafter to the rest of the Americas. It is in that context of the very necessity to define oneself as African arose. So he's saying that the very first Pan-African sentiments were born in the Caribbean. However, we're gonna ask the question of, is that true? Right. So again, he goes into someone in the African continent would see himself largely in terms of his particular ethnic group or clan or village or family group. He goes on to say that, um, you know, there's a particular type of contact based on exploitation of black by white. And is in that situation that the necessity arose for black people to define to defined, to be defined as black. But we'll ask the question, was that the first time that we had this type of uh, interaction with non blacks? where we had the necessity to define ourselves as Black. Again, he talks about um, Pan-Africanism at that point in time, where it was born in substance, even if it was not so regarded, even if the terminology was not applied to that substance. And he's talking about the unity which the slaves forged, a commonality which could only be operative when they move against European exploitation and oppression. It was a question of survival. So it's dealing with Pan-African sentiments as a question of survival. He's dealing with this in the, um, you know, going from the 15th century on. Um, and to do so, it was necessary to break down the interdistinctions between one African and another. The essence of Pan-Africanism in the period when it was born, the 15th century, uh, and it had to be born in a context where a large number of Africans from different social backgrounds were thrown into a context in which this necessity would arise. But again, we're questioning, was that the first time that this has happened? And was this the first time that Black people defined ourselves Black against our non-Black enemies, particularly? So again, we're asking the question, is that true? Was the 15th century the first time Black people came together on the basis of being Black for our self-protection, for our self-interest, and for the interests of our progeny? So where we have the uh, two young students who are trying to find out, is this true, right? And we've got Mahat uh, going to weigh, weigh this on the scale. So impetus for unity, Nana Rodney was apparently unaware of the Zanish revolution in which enslaved African equals black people in modern day Iraq near Basra some 600 years prior to the period of which he spoke, or the Hyksos invasion of Kemet 3000 years prior and their enslavement of the Kemeti black people who according to Imahu Manetho, having overpowered the rulers of the land, they then burned our cities ruthlessly, raised to the ground the temples of the gods and treated all the natives with a cruel hostility, massacring some and leading into slavery, the wives and children of others. So again, we can see a few cases. He says that the Caribbean was the first place where our uh, blacks were led you know, into enslavement, but that's not according to the historical record. And part of the challenge is that many uh, are not exposed to classical you know, history, uh, being able to read the text as they were written by our own ancestors. But we'll come back to that point. And if you want to look at what those enslavers look like, you can see the Amu on the bottom left, and then also the actual photograph on the top right of the slide. And the top left is an image showing you a depiction of the Zand Rebellion. So the hypothesis is that the concept and practice of unifying African equals Black people is an ancient African equals Black imperative seen in all of these uh, ethnic groups and kingdoms where they were always growing into progressively larger social political groupings. However, the most important one of these is Kemet because that's the one that we know where we actually define ourselves as black people, Kemetio, right? So the original foreign policy thrust was to integrate more African uh, black people into Kemet and to incorporate more land of African black people. There was little or no interest to incorporate uh, or integrate with Asiatic so-called or as we would prefer Eurasians, or even to just leave the term Amu as it was until very late in the history of Kemet, land of black people. Now, I'm not the first one to come with this uh, thesis or hypothesis. Of Bimfo, Nana John Henry Clark says he defines Pan-Africanism 
uh, in the following way, he, and he refers to the first time uh, where he says, any effort on the part of African people to reclaim any portion of Africa that has been taken away, mutilated. And he says, when he looks back at the historical role and the historical manifestations, he deals with the first organized society in the Nile Valley, where the people of the South and the North, the Upper and Lower Nile came together to roam a country now known to the world as Egypt. The unification of the Upper Nile and Lower Nile was an act of Pan-Africanism. Uh, or being for Kwame Nantambu says the same thing, you know, a little bit later, where he says, when the Pharaoh Aha, also known as Narmer, and we named Menace for the Greeks, he was the first historic ruler, the first dynasty in Kemet, where he united Upper and Lower Kemet into one nation, right? So he's dealing with this as uh, the means by which we came together to form one country under the rule to be able to resist foreign aggression and invasion into Alia, right? So he's saying that it did not begin in the 15th century. So he's speaking directly to Nana Walter Rodney, but circa 3200 BCE, right? This point was also made by Ata Ekweyama, you know, a few years later, where he says, uh, if Pan-Africanism is the ideal of Africans coming together in one polity history, presents early examples, their ethos peaked in the unificatory ideologies that created Egypt thousands of years ago, right? So we see this right here in the dictionary. This is uh, Faulkner's dictionary. We see Kim translates to black. This is a root word. And then you have Kemet, the black land as they translate it, uh, more appropriately translated as land of the blacks. And then the same root is here in Kemet, also known as Kemetiu. Right, and the earliest attestation actually has the two bird. We'll get a chance to see that. And this is where you know we get this as commits you. Now, the whites and their lackeys, they like to just translate this as Egyptians or whatever. And they say Kemet just means irrigated land. But these are you know white fraudsters. And then you know you have others who are either duped themselves or trying to dupe other black people into this. But very clearly you see the same Kim of black. You see the same Kim here of black, but then when we come here, they don't want to translate as black anymore. They like to translate as Egyptians, but this is the same black man, woman, plural, determinative. So we asked the question of who were the commits you? These are actual photographs that I took myself when I was in Kemet. You can see very clearly how we depicted ourselves as black people. So it becomes very obvious. The reason why we call ourselves black people is because we were black people and we still are black people. Now, um, according to Mam Sierra Tujopi says, the Egyptians had only one term to designate themselves, Kemet, the Negroes literally. This is the strongest term existing in the Pharaonic tongue to indicate blackness, right? So this is something that's very important. And he talks about how the Nahasu, what is referred to as Nubians, and Nahas, or Nahasi singular, that there's no color connotation of that. To, it's a deliberate mistranslation to render it Negro, as is done in uh, publications at that time and even still to this day. Um, but you know what we're coming to is that the one that actually does have the color connotation is Kemet, the Black people. The Nahasu are those who qualify as Black uh, phenotypically, but do not have allegiance to Kemet, the land of Black people. And this is an actual photo where you see the uh, Ramesh here. Now, um, in this uh, text, there's actually a text by Albin for Manu Ampim uh, that you can see here at the bottom, um, where it's manuampim.com slash ramesses3.htm, where you have these white so-called scholars who mislabel. So Hornung, he mislabels the black skin group as Nubians, even though the text clearly reads Ramesh, right? These are the Kometsu, so-called Egyptians. So it's clear that he distorts intentionally and mislabels the scene, right? Yoko does the same thing where he presents the same three distort distortions and he mislabels the black skin group A as Kushites, despite the text right here reading clearly from Mesh the Ur, the Cha, man, woman, plural. And then that same thing appears here, but they cut it off here and they forget that it's written right above their heads. Now, the very first case that we found, you know, in terms of um, this attestation of the word Kemet, you find in Kemetiu of uh, Black people. And this is in the uh, pyramid text of uh, Mesu Biti Merira Pepi. And it says, you stand, in the, you stand in front of the Kemetiu like the Apis, 
referring to the A plus bow, right? Now, this is one thing that they, they like to do is they say, uh, those of the black land, right? And, you know, here, uh, this guy, Alan, he translates it as term for cultivable soil along the banks of the Nile. Now, here you see very clearly that the two bird is there and the two is like saying uh, A-N, right? We say American or German or any of those types of things. So the two lets you know you're talking about a human population. And again, the root word here is chem, again, translating to black. If anyone tells you differently, they are a fraudster intentionally defrauding you. Here again, you see this determinative, the village with the crossroads. And here you see it very clearly that this is used in Kemet. They like to translate as the black land. However, when you see the two bird, you know that you're dealing with people, human beings. So black people, right? And then here you have the determinative of a settlement, right? A village, a land, any of those types of translations will work. And again, you stand in the front of the comments you. Now you have those who say, oh no, that just means uh, arthritis, which is chem or, but that's different from the t of the tu, right? So chem met tu, right? So this is something that is very clear. And at the same time that this is going on, this is from the reign of Mesobiti Pepe, you have people who are referring to themselves as black. So this text says, mayor, seal bearer of the ruler of lower Kemet, unique companion, carrier of the ritual book, overseer of the servants of the Necha, the true overseer of upper Kemet, Neok Pepe, his good name, Hepi Kem. And the Kem is right here, Hepi Black. Right? No dispute here that this is referring to the black person who is referring to himself as Hepi Black. It's like the rapper who calls himself Black Thought, right? It's not because he's sitting on cultivable soil, but because he himself is Black. <clears throat> and that's not the only one from the exact same period in time that you saw the other text where it says you stand in front of the uh, Kometiu as an apis bull. At the exact same time that that was being written, you have others who are referring to themselves as Black, with Kim being the adjective to describe, which comes after uh, the noun, proper noun or otherwise. So it says his son, his beloved, his praise, seal bearer of the ruler of Lower Kemet, unique companion, overseer of the servants of the Necher, uh, Pepe Ankh, his good name, Henenit Kim, right? Henenit Kim. So here you see Henenit, the black, black Henenit. And again, he's referring to himself as black. This is a human being referring to himself using the adjective Kim, black, now, what's interesting is that Coptic is the last stage of language and it preserves not only the form, but the meaning of that exact same Kim. So this is from a, a text called the Song of Solomon from the Coptic Bible, right? And it has all of the same pronouns, all of the same words, but you see Anok An Al Kami, right? So I am black, but beautiful, Ala Neshwe, right? Here you see Mapur, Choshit, Ero A, they um, okame anok, right? Don't look at me because I'm black. And here you see the same kame, right? And again, because Coptic is the last stage of the written language, you can find the exact same words and they mean the exact same thing. If anyone tells you differently, this is an intentional fraudster who is trying to hustle people, either a paid or amateur agent who needs to be dealt with. Let's continue. So here we see the test involves acquisition of specimens. And this is Mam uh, Joe's melanin test, where he got a few square millimeters of mummified skin, coated them with ethyl benzoate, and then was able to count the melanin gradually to show a level non existent in white skin races. So he actually went and got their skin to show that these are black people. So it's obvious why we're calling ourselves black people. So now the question comes well, what did we do on the basis of being black? Did we do anything on the basis of being black? And one of the best examples of this Pan-Africanism comes from the autobiography of Imahu Weni from uh, Ab Abju in the sixth dynasty, where he brings together all types of black people in order to take military action against the non-blacks, the Amu. <coughs> so we'll go through the translation here. For those who can read Metanetra, you can read the Metanetra, but here you see the Amu, which is the term we're translating as Eurasians. So when his servant, and this comes from him, they like to translate this as um, majesty or incarnation more recently. Well, this is the same hymn that you see in Servant of the Nature, 
So when a servant drove away the Amu sand dwellers, his servant made an army of many tens of thousands, and the servant is referring to the ruler of Kemet, made an army of many tens of thousands from all of Upper Kemet, like from the extent of Abu in the south to Medanit in the north, from the land of marshes, Lower Kemet, like the extent of the two sides of the house. So he's bringing together Upper and Lower Kemet, you know, east and west of Kemet, the two sides of the house, everybody's coming together, all the black people are coming together to take military action against these non-black Amu. <clears throat> now he brings in all the other commits you, right? right? People who qualify as black, but they are self-identifying as Nahasu. So, and from Sergir and Ken Sejru, from Irje Nahasu, Meja Nahasu, Yam Nahasu, Wawat Nahasu, Kao Nahasu, and from Shemelan. So what you see is that this is the first Pan-African force where they're actually bringing together all the black people in the area in order to take military action against non-black people, right? So what we're doing is we're using evaluative criteria, evidence of knowledge of self, evidence of knowledge of enemy. So this deals with unification among blacks, either di diplomatic or militaristic, in this case it's both. Um, expansion of the land of black people, diplomatic or militaristic, in this case it's both on the nature of other Blacks who do not identify as Kometiu, this is the Nahasu, that at this early time, they're willing to identify with those who self-identify as Kometiu Black people, and they're willing to come together in a military force against these non-Blacks. Evidence of knowledge of enemy, you see that deals with blocking of Eurasian incursion, so check there. Expulsion of Eurasians from the land of Black people, military action against Eurasians, check there. It also deals with the nature of the Eurasians, this more latently, but the fact that they need to be driven away, it tells you a little bit about you know, their encroaching nature. We find a similar thing in the prophecies of Imahu Neferti given in the court of uh, Saras and Neferu, the fourth uh, dynasty. Now, what's interesting is that these texts are prior to uh, the later text, which is the first uh, evidence of us uh, seeing Kometsu that was coming from uh, Nesubiti. Sara Pepe, uh, Marimre Pepe. So what we see is that even before, and it's uh, along the lines of what Nana Walter Rodney was saying that even before the 19, the run up to the 1900 conference where the term Pan-Africanism was born, you had people doing very Pan-African actions, right? Saying Africa for the Africans like Nana Martin Delaney did long before the term was coined. Similarly, you have all of these Pan-African actions before we even see the first attestation of the word Kometiu. So it was born in substance before the term was coined per se. But again, a lot of this even deals with, um, there's a paucity of evidence that there's a lot of things. The term may have been in existence before this, but you know, we'll deal with it in terms of absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. That is to say, even though we don't see the term there, it could exist and any archeological dig can uncover it. So this is talking about the nature of the Amu. It says the Amu, the Eurasians travel by their strength. They terrorize the hearts of those upon the harvest, meaning farmers. They seize oxen on the plow. So here are these Amu, these Southwestern Eurasians who are terrorists way back then, right? Terrorizing the hearts of those upon the harvest. <laughs> And it deals with them metaphorically, it refers to them like a strange bird. It says a strange bird will breed in the Delta Marsh, having made its nest beside the people. The people haven't let it approach due to apathy or indifference. So this is saying that by allowing these Amu to come into the Delta due to apathy and indifference, that this leads to destroy and taking away are those things of goodness. All goodness has been expelled. The land is cast down due to misfortune because of those feeders, Eurasians who roam the land, right? So these are the Setiu, the Amu, they've come in and they are bringing destruction, death and destruction, rape and ravishing, pillage and plunder to the land of black people. Enemies have appeared in the East. Eurasians, the Amu, and again, you see the initial, the original term, have come down into Kemet. And again, Kemet is the land of Black people. So we're lamenting that these Amu come into Kemet. Now, one interesting thing is that Kemet has a connotation of Blackness, Black, you know, land of Black people, right, or the Black nation. 
However, amu does not have a connotation of whiteness. Here you just have am, which is a throw stick, letting you know that they're foreigners. So whereas we're organizing on the basis of being black, we're not referring to them, and they themselves are not organizing on the basis of being white, we're just referring to them on the basis of their foreignness, that they're foreign to the land of black people, which they still are. <clears throat> but it deals with the resolution of this problem. So it says, this Nesu will come from the South, Ameni, true of voice his name, son of this woman of Taseti, child of the interior of Nechen. He will take the white crown, he will wear the red crown, he will join the two mighty ones. Eurasians, and again, you see the Amu here referring to those who are on that landmass now known as Eurasia. So Eurasians will fall to his sword, Libyans to his flame. This is Chim Hu. And what's interesting is that before the whitening of Ta Chim Hu, they were counted among the black allies. And you can find them depicted as black on the uh, complex of Nesubichi Sahure. <clears throat> However, by this point in time, much later, the Chim Hu are counted among the enemies. And by this time, you have uh, the whitening of that area. <clears throat> so they're included among the enemies. So the Amu will fall to the sword. The Chim Hu will fall to the flame. Rebels to his wrath, traitors due to all of him. The Uraeus on his forehead subduing the rebels for him. One will build the walls of the ruler. Now, this is so powerful. One will build the walls of the ruler, life, prosperity, health, to bar Eurasians from entering Kemet. So we're keeping these non-Blacks, these foreigners, out of the land of Black people. So we're even building walls to prevent them from coming into the land of Black people. Now, if this isn't Pan-Africanism, then there's nothing that's been done since the coining of the term before or after that is Pan-Africanism. This is truly protecting the land of Black people. Black people coming together on the basis of being Black for our survival against common non-Black enemies. And it says, they shall, and again, it's referring to the Amu, these Eurasians, they shall beg water as beggars to allow their cattle to drink. Then Ma'at will return to her seat while Isfet is driven away, right? So these people in modern times, they say Ma'at is like, you know, holding hands, singing Kumbaya, turn the other cheek. But Ma'at is not anything about that. When you read the primary text, Ma'at will only be able to return to her seat after these ones have fallen to the sword, those ones have fallen to the flame, and, you know, they are driven out as the very incarnation of Isfet. Isfet being, you know, wrongdoing, falsehood, all of these types of connotations. So here, you know, I want you to check it yourself. This deals with unification among Blacks, right, in the sense of, you know, Amini is going to come and drive out these Eurasians militaristically, expansion of the land of Black people. But basically what I want you to do, and this is your assignment, is to look at these different criteria and see, does this text qualify as Pan-Africanism? Does it deal with evidence of knowledge of self, right, in the Black survival thrust? Does it deal with evidence of knowledge of enemy and preventing the enemies of Black people from destroying Black people? If so, then we will say that this is truly a Pan-African text, but I'll leave this to you in order to evaluate. We find similar sentiments in uh, Imahu Sanhat's text, where again, it has the idea of bringing other Africans equals Blacks into the empire by gaining their allegiance through force or diplomacy while maintaining a focus or repelling the Amu, the Eurasians, right? And it says, I made the road walking north. I reached the walls of the ruler created to repel Eurasians and crush sand-faring Bedouins, right? So they're very clear. These people in modern times may not be so clear on who the enemy is, but in classical Kemet, we were very clear that we are building, and again, it's a reference that we saw in the prophecy of Imahu Neferti, the walls of the ruler that were created to repel the Eurasians and to crush Sanfer and Bedouins, right? And again, it talks about bringing other Black people in while, you know, ignoring these Eurasians. It says he has extended state frontiers. And this is what Pan-Africanism in the classical form was all about, is bringing in more Black people and more lands of Black people. But let's reassess, he has extended the state frontiers. He will take possession of the southern lands without thinking about the foreign lands to the north. He was born to smash the Eurasians 
and to trample upon the sand faring Bedouins. <clears throat> so again, very clear in terms of bringing together black people, smashing non-black people and trampling upon them, right? So if it's dealing with the black survival thrust, the knowledge of self, in that regard, then we would have to regard this as well as a Pan-African text. If it deals with uh, evidence of knowledge of enemy, then again, it, we have to regard it as a Pan-African text, right? It's dealing with blocking the Eurasian incursion, expelling them, right, on their very nature. All of these things come. <clears throat> and this is probably my favorite text from the history of Kemet out of the many hundreds that I've read. And even for this particular project, we have a, a good, just short of 100 texts that we'll be bringing forward in the forthcoming book. Um, what we're doing now is we're releasing an article that's going to have about 12 texts, and then the book is going to have at least, so far we have well over between 80 and 90 texts, but by the time it's all said and done, we should have you know approximately 100 or, or more. But it says, a ruler is in Hudwerit, and another in Kush. Uh, I sitting joined with an Am and a Nahasi, right? The Am is the Eurasian and Nahasi is what they now translate as Nubian, right? I prefer not even to give these Eurasian translations, but to give the original text. Now, one issue that we find is that the Am and the Nahas, the Amu and the Nahasu are in league with each other. And they're actually sending letters back and forth about how they're going to subdue and uh, divide up the land of black people. We'll see that in the text, so that's come. Each man having his <clears throat> own portion of this Kemet land of black people, sharing the land with me. Now, again, you have the Nahasu who qualify as black people phenotypically, but do not see themselves as black people. They don't self-identify as such, and rather they're willing to be in league with these Amu, with these non-blacks. And what's so important about this is that we have a very similar situation right now. In contemporary times, we have uh, those who qualify phenotypically as black, but they don't self-identify as black, right? <clears throat> they don't even want to deal with Kemet as being land of black people, and they want to identify as black Americans and ADOS and American slaves and so forth, descendants of slaves, all types of stuff. So this is a situation that we are in right now, right? We have those who are in league with the Amu, who the Amu are saying it means black soil, and then they're following boss. So they're in league with the Amu to this day. They say, yes, boss, it means black soil. Yes, boss. Um, and they're lying to the people. They're lying to the people. And, you know, that is something that is not tolerable for us. <clears throat> and it says, <clears throat> I shall engage in battle with him and I shall slit his belly. For my intention is to save Kemet, land of black people, striking the Eurasians. Dividing the land with me is not tolerable for me. By the same token, you know, it's not tolerable for us to deal with these anti-Black sellout house Negroes who are defrauding the people. It says the Eurasians allied with him. I shall sail northwards to do battle with the Eurasians. And again, you see the term Amu, the original term that was used, and success will come to pass. If he intends, if he intends to be at ease, and then there's a lacuna in the text, and it says, then his eyes will be about to weep, and the entire land will say the ruler within Waset, so-called thieves, Kamos the Valiant, is protector of Kemet, right? Very powerful. Mek Kemet, the protector of the land of Black people, <clears throat> which is what we still need to this very day, protector of the land of Black people. I sailed north to my victory to drive back the Eurasians by the command of Amen, corrective counsel, my courageous army in front of me like a blast of fire. Let's, let's look at that, like a blast of fire. <laughs> now, this is so powerful, right? So this is someone who's clear on what it means to be Kemeti and to protect Kemeti you and Kemet the land of Black people, <clears throat> driving back these Eurasians. <clears throat> he says, with the archers of the Majau, now these are those who otherwise qualified as Black people, and not only do they qualify, but they're actually fighting alongside the Black people. Right, the Nahasu that are mentioned in the classical text, they have now been fully incorporated into Kemet, the land of Black people, which was the whole goal of Pan-Africanism. It says, with the archers of the Majau, upland of our encampment, ready to seek out the Setiu and destroy their dwellings, 
I sent the mighty archers of Majau while I was on watch near Wahit to confront Teti, son of Pepi. Now, this is a sellout, Teti, son of Pepi. We'll see exactly what he's doing. Within Neferusi, without letting him flee, I confined the Eurasians who were defying Kemet land of Black people, for he had made Neferusi as a nest for the Eurasians. And he's referring to, again, this Teti, son of Pepi. Now, here you have somebody who is located in Kemet, who qualifies as Kemeti and is right there, but he has sold out the Kemetu. He has made this place, Neferusi, as a nest for these Eurasians. And this is just what we're dealing with to this very day. Those who are in league with the Eurasians, right, who are allowing them to get free reign, who are, you know, taking Eurasian theories and trying to shove it down the throats of Black people. And these are anti-Black sellouts and they should be dealt with as such. Let's continue. It says, as I'm in the valiant indoors, I will not let you alone. I will not let you tread the ground without my being upon you. May your heart quake thereat with miserable Eurasian. And again, you see the singular am um, here, am um, chaz, right? I took them away entirely. I did not leave anything of a virus for it was emptied out. Oh, unfortunate Eurasian, let your heart quake thereat, oh, miserable Eurasian. And now I say that when he talks about let your heart quake thereat, I was thinking about shook ones, right? All these shook ones, you ain't a, you ain't a crook, son, you're a shook one. Uh, he's saying, let your heart quake thereat, oh, miserable Eurasian. You got to get him a soundtrack for that. And he says, I will leave them laid waste without people there. I destroyed their towns. I burned their abodes, being made into desolate mounds forever because of the destruction they make inside this Kemet. And again, Kemet, the land of black people, you see it right here, Kemet, right? So there's, he's not saying anything about uh, irrigated lands and the soil of black. He's talking about what they've done to the land of black people. And he's going to defend the land of black people. He, there's nothing about agriculture and irrigated land anywhere in here. There is ideological clarity about protecting black people. So he says, because of the destruction they make inside this Kemet, who made them, referring to the Kemet you, serve for the Amu. These are the foreigners, the Amu, the Eurasians. When they overran Kemet, again, land of black people, their mistress, right? So those who want to make this an agricultural thing <laughs> are liars. They are fraudsters, and they should be dealt with as liars, intentional liars and fraudsters, because none of the primary texts are dealing with it as, oh, you know, we're just trying to uh, till the soil. We're referring to the soil as black right now. So, you know, these are not people uh, to be respected. These are wretches with broken hearts, these cowards. Um, but again, the reason why we deal with this as a Pan-African text is because it's dealing with unification among blacks, diplomatic and military, expansion of the land of black people. It deals with the nature of other blacks who do not identify as Kometi on this side. Is dealing with those, the Mejau, but then it's also dealing with somebody who's located in Kemet, that's Teti, son of Pepe, who was sold out to Black people. <clears throat> so what's powerful about this, um, these two stella of Sarah Kamos is it gives us our entire social theory. It tells us what to do about the non-Black invaders. It tells us what to do about internal sellouts. And then it also tells us what to do about those who are in league with these Amu. Right, as I mentioned that the Amu and the Nahasu were writing letters, love letters back and forth about we're gonna divide up the towns. And however, fortunately, that letter was intercepted and what the big plans that the Amu had did not come to pass. We also get a general view of the Amu as seen in the passage from the instruction to uh, Sarah Mary Kare. And it says, but this should be said to the archer, yo, the wretched Eurasian, he is miserable because of the place he's in, troubles of water, difficulties of wood. Paths are many and painful because of mountains. He does not dwell in one place. Food propels his legs. Occupied by want, goes around the desert on his two feet. He fights since the time of Heru, not conquering nor being conquered. He does not announce a day of combat like a thief driven out of a community. Now he's dealing with them being so wretched because of the place that they are in. And this is very similar to Mom Joke, what we now refer to as the two cradle theory, where he's dealing with the environmental impact uh, in terms of their aggressive nature, in terms of you know their behavior. But we can deal with this, you know, as well. 
It says, when the archers were a sealed wall, I made lower Kemet attack them. I captured their, I captured their inhabitants. I seized their cattle into the Eurasians. And again, you see the Amu aboard the land of black people. Do not concern yourself with them. The Eurasian is a crocodile on its shore. It snatches from a lonely road. It cannot see from a populous town. And again, this is a Pan-African text because it deals with the black survival thrust and fighting against the enemies who are against our very survival. So we come here to the King of Fear of Kometu consciousness. What we find is that, you know, Nana Walter Rodney said that this Kometu consciousness was born where we were in a context against these, uh, you know, oppressive exploiters. And he said that the first time that that happened was the 15th century. Now, I'll just say that he probably was not aware of times that that happened prior to that. But what we do find is that that crucible, that context where we have non-Black enemies, that just like in contemporary times or more recent historical times, that you know we found other times where we were in a very similar type of situation, where we have non-Blacks who are threatening our survival, so we come together on the basis of being Black. And we do this every single time that we're surrounded by non-Blacks. It happened in Haiti, right? It happened in Palmares in Brazil, right? It happened, you know, in the South, in uh, San Miguel de Guadalpe, right? This is 1526, the very first uprising on what would become United Snake Soil, right? And we're able to rise up and defeat our non-Black enemies, right? No matter where we came from, we say, you know what? We're going to come together on the basis of being Black and to defeat our non-Black enemies. Same thing happened in Jamaica, right? Uh, Nana Samuel Sharp, right? Nana Paul Bokel saying, uh, cleave to the Black. We see this time, you know, in Iraq, right? The Zanz Rebellion. Anytime we can see it in Bougainville, what's uh, referred to as Mecca Mui, right? Here you have Black people coming together on the basis of being Black against non-Black enemies. And this is the Kometu consciousness that anytime we're in that situation, then Kala, which is represented by the color Black, will be born. It comes to its head and then it may wane and then you know pass away. But it's always there in gestation, waiting to be born again. When we have a context where we have non-Black enemies and we'll come together on the basis of being Black again, right? And you see this in the Kikongo uh, language, and then you also see it as it's expressed in Kemet, where it refers to Ra saying, Yachapri in the morning, Ra at noon, then Atum at sunset. And then you say, Ra Hatep M Usir, Usir Pu Hatep M Ra, which is to say, Ra rests as Usir and Usir rests as Ra, right? So again, this is the Kometu uh, consciousness and the Dikenga theory of Kometu consciousness is that anytime we're in a similar situation that will come together on the basis of what we have in common, common ancestry, common descent. But the, again, similar circumstances, both ancient and modern, when we're surrounded by non-Black enemies, then we come together as Black people to defeat those non-Black enemies. But we are not the only people who are only creatures who are intelligent enough to do this. You'll find that uh, at war, water buffalo will do the same thing when they are hemmed in by their lion enemies, that these buffalo are willing to come together. They will even gore lions to death. They will uh, shove their horns into the lion cubs in order to uh, gore them to death. Right. This is what they will do. They'll come together on the basis of common ancestry and common descent. They won't say, oh, lions, you're mammals, too. I guess we all got to get along. They'll say, no, we are buffalo and we're going to come together. So basically, the idea is that these buffalo are intelligent, but they're not more intelligent or, you know, let's say even less intelligent than the Kometu, that we're also intelligent enough to come together on the basis of common ancestry and common descent to fight our enemies who are threatening our very survival. All intelligent creatures, all intelligent social creatures do this, right? And you can see this in this video. I think we'll share this. And this is called Battle at Kruger. And you find lions. Who are attacking this young buffalo. However, the buffalo are intelligent enough to come together on the basis of being buffalo 
to fight their non-Buffalo enemies. This is the analogous situation to what Black people have done in the past and throughout our entire history to fight against our non-Black enemies. I think we'll speed this up. Now you see a crocodile is in it. Just trying to fight the lions in order to take that buffalo. But the lions won. Or so it seems until the buffalo come in force to fight their non-buffalo enemies. Right, and those buffalo are black. As we used to refer to ourselves, Ka not the strong bull. And they're coming together against their enemies. Kicking kicking Now, are you telling me Buffalo are smarter than black people? No. And they're going to drop off all of these lions. They're going to drop off all of these lions and save one of their own. And amazingly, yes, that calf is going to be standing up. And this is what is accomplished when we come together on the basis of common ancestry and common descent, that we're all Black people. All intelligent social creatures come together on the basis of what they have in common to defeat our enemies who are threatening our survival. Common ancestry, common descent, survival, the first law of nature is what Kemet is all about. That's the reason why we call it Kemet. That's the reason why we call ourselves Kemet to you. So the buffalo were victorious, I think that's good. We'll see that also in the ocean. Now, fish come together on the basis of what they have in common in schools and in shoals, right? Now they didn't have to go and take notes from buffalo and buffalo didn't have to go and take notes from fish, but all intelligent social creatures come together on the basis of what they have in common, common ancestry, common descent. And you can't tell me that fish are more intelligent than black people. No, we came up with this idea thousands of years ago when we decided to call ourselves Kemet to you, black people, and we decided to call our land Kemet, the land of black people. And in text after text after text, we are fighting our non-black enemies who are threatening our survival. What Kemet, the meaning of Kemet, the reason why Kemet is important is not because of the glory. Look at how we built all these great things. All these white people don't want to tell us about our glory. The most important thing about Kemet is that we call the land Kemet. The most important thing about Kemet is that we called ourselves Kemet to you. And this is what we need to know about. And this is why, in my humble opinion, Eurasians don't want us to know about Kemet and why they use the term ancient Egyptians, why they uh, uh, get all of these people who qualify, the modern day Teti son of Pepes, who qualify as black people. But this is why these white people hire them in order to say, no, it just means black soil. Go around your people and tell them it just means irrigated land, right? Because they don't want us to know the most important thing about Kemet is not about the gold and the glory that is subsequent to, that is as a result of what happens when we understand that we're all black people and we come together on that basis. We find the same thing, orca come together against uh, sharks, right? And they're able to defeat them. Again, they come together on the basis of we're all orca, Common ancestry, common descent leads to common objectives, common interests. Uh, lions do the same thing, as do hyenas. Hyenas come together on the basis of common ancestry, common descent against their common enemies, lions. And lions do the same thing. They come again on the basis, they come together on common ancestry, common descent against their enemies, which are the hyenas, right? So they're not dealing with it on a class analysis. Oh, look, hyena workers, let's go work with them, right? That is uh, ideological fraud in order to give you a false consciousness, right? The only thing that is real is who are you going to give birth to and who gave birth to you? Common ancestry, common descent. That's the only thing that's real. They're not coming together. Look, all hyena females unite with the 
a lion female. That's because they're not stupid, right? Survival is the name of the game. And that is the reason why it's coming. And somebody shared this on a BB to me. And again, a BB to me is translates to black power. It says, I know you've been slaughtering and eating my con for thousands of years, but I don't hate you. You're my brother. We're, we're both animals. I don't see species. It sounds just as silly as uh, when Negro said. And interestingly, none of Marcus Garvey, who brought forth the RBG, he said, in a world of wolves, one should go armed. And one of the most powerful defensive weapons within the reach of Negroes is a practice of race first in all parts of the world, right? So he's talking about Black people coming together on the basis of being Black. Like he's not the first one to come up with that idea. We find this exact same thing in Kemet. That's the reason why it's called Kemet. That's the reason why we called ourselves Kemet to you. That's the reason why we built walls of the ruler. That's the reason why we had texts about driving out the Amu. All of this is on the basis of Black people being Black. But when we don't know who our enemies are, then we're willing to allow these wolves to come close. And there's an article that came out, Yellowstone Elk Don't Budge for Wolves. And this is because the wolves were taken out of Yellowstone in the 20s. They were reintroduced in the early 90s. So you had generation after generation of elk who were not exposed to their enemy. And when you don't know who your enemy is, then you are going to allow that enemy to come right up on you and slaughter you, right? And that's the case of, you know, many, uh, black ethnic groups, African ethnic groups who, who have been removed from their common predator, their common enemy, right? This is a situation now. But when we do know who our enemy is, then we come together in modern times on the basis of being black. You see this in the Haitian Revolution, you see this in the Stoner Rebellion, right? And you see Massacre de Blancs par le Noir, right? very beautiful black people coming together on the basis of being black as we did in Kemet right the first time this happened was not the 1500s we find this as the very at the very inception of Kemet right right black people coming together on the basis of being black against their non-black enemies right the most significant slave uprising that took place in colonial America was the Stoner Rebellion I would most likely have to agree with that just short of the uprising that happened uh, known as the Civil War, because you had even more Black people um, beating that white behind. You see this in Haiti, Black people coming together on the basis of being Black. This is why we call this the Dikenga theory, that this Kala, the Blackness of Kala, it will rise whenever we're put into a similar situation. Same thing here, Revolt General de Negre, Massacre de Blanc. You see Black people coming together on the basis of being Black against their non-Black enemies. The same thing that Buffalo would do when they're surrounded by their enemies. Same thing that Lions would do when they're surrounded by their enemies. Same thing Hyenas would do when they're surrounded by their enemies. Same thing Fish would do when they're surrounded by their enemies. Same thing Dolphins would do. Like any creature, any social creature that's intelligent will come together on the basis of being Black. Kweku Jai, meba. And then you see the same thing in classical Kemet, where you see Black people coming together to crush the non-Black enemies underfoot. And this is such a beautiful image. And these are the photographs that we don't get a chance to see, right? That aren't really shown to us. What we get is Prince of Egypt. We get the mummy. We get these sellout house Negroes who say, no, it doesn't mean Black. You know, Kemet just means soil. What in the world does this have to do with the soil being Black? This has everything to do with us self-identifying as Black people to drive out our non-Black enemies. Now, again, when we talk about this Dikenga theory of Kometsu consciousness, that this same consciousness rose again in the person of Nana Chancellor Williams, right? And he wasn't the first one to come with this. Obviously, we were doing this in Kemet, we were doing this in Haiti, we were doing this in Jamaica, but he came to the exact same conclusion where he says, the whites are the implacable foe, the traditional and everlasting enemy of the Blacks, the compelling reason for pu uh, publicly putting this declaration in its historical context is clear. The necessary re-education of Blacks and a possible solution to the racial crisis can begin strangely enough only when Blacks fully realize this central fact in their lives. The white man is their bitter enemy. For this is not the ranting of wild-eyed wild militancy, but the calm and unmistakable verdict of several thousand years of documented history. So we're bringing this up to the point of the king of theory. Here you have all types of people in the civil rights movement who don't know this, but guess what? We were in a similar situation. 
Kala comes, this Dikenga rises again of saying, look, we're all black people, let's come together on the basis of being black against our non-black enemies. That rose again in Nana Chancellor Williams. This rose again in uh, Nana Malcolm X, where he says, we have a common enemy, we have this in common, we have a common oppressor, a common exploiter, and a common discriminator. But once we all realize that we have this common enemy, then we unite on the basis of what we have in common. And what we have foremost in common is that enemy, the white man. He's an enemy to all of us. I know some of you think that some of them are enemies, time will tell. Again, this Kala came and this Dikenga consciousness rose again of guess what, we're all black. We are common non-black enemies, let's come together on that basis. Same thing, uh, Nana Amos Wilson, he says, that you know this hope that you have that the white man is going to accept us, is going to feed your children before he feeds his own, that he's going to clothe you before he clothes his own. So you have uh, that he's going to give up his ill-gotten gains and wealth in the name of some bogus brotherhood or class of society is a vain hope. Give it up, turn it loose. That again, he's saying that these whites are coming together on the basis of what they have in common. Of uh, their, you know, all quote unquote whites, they're all Amu, right? The racial relatives the racial kinfolk of the Amu, and they're coming together on the basis of what they have in common. It's up to us to do the same. Uh, Nana David Walker told us that it is no more harm for you to kill a man who is trying to kill you than for you to take a drink of water when thirsty, right? So he's saying that us as Black people, and he says this is an appeal to the colored citizens of the world as we refer to ourselves, and he's talking about coming together on the basis of what we have in common. It rose again, the Kenga theory. So they, it came again in the person of uh, Nana Bantu Biko, where he says the fact that we are all not white does not necessarily mean that we are all black. He says real black people are those who can manage to hold their heads high in defiance rather than willingly surrender their souls to the white man. He says black consciousness, and this is the commensu consciousness, is in essence the realization by the black man of the need to rally together with his brothers around the cause of their oppression, of their operation rather, the blackness of their skin and to operate as a group in order to rid themselves of the shackles that bind them to perpetual servitude. That was the first time that anyone thought, you know what, let's come together on the basis of being black at the time of Nana Steve Biko. No, it was not. Was the first time that it happened in Jamaica? No, it was not. Was the first time in Haiti? No, it was not. Was the first time in the 15th century? No, it was not that we see that every single time we're in a similar situation that gives rise to similar commensal consciousness and similar actions. And again, not a Marcus Garvey, the illustrious and praiseworthy, he said that he came up with an idea. He thought that a name, Universal Negro Improvement Association, uh, would embrace the purpose of all black humanity. Again, black people coming together on the basis of being black. And after he heard about the horrors of native life in Africa, he was put into that same situation of, guess what, we have common enemies. Let's come together on the basis of what we have in common. And this is from the text, The Negro's Greatest Enemy. So we deal with this in terms of scale of Africanness slash Blackness. We have genotype, phenotype, identity, allegiance, character, and behavior. That all of these are criteria by which we can see the degree to which someone is Black, right? that they may be black in terms of genotype and phenotype, but in terms of identity, like the Nahasu, they didn't self-identify as Kometsu. And we have that same type of situation now. We got people who are calling themselves ADOS in Black America. So they qualify genotypically and phenotypically, but they do not qualify in terms of identity. Now you have Teti son of Pepe, who is someone who's in Kemet, right? One of the Kometsu, but, and so you can see he has identity as Kometsu, but his allegiance is to the Amu, where he made a nest for Nefrusi, um, you know, for these Amu. Then in terms of character, in terms of behavior, all of these things help us to understand what we should really understand when we're thinking about Kometsu in classical times or modern times. Now, when did this situation flip? It flipped due to Nana Kwame Nkrumah, where he says Garvey's ideology was concerned with Black nationalism as opposed to African nationalism. It was a fifth Pan-African Congress that provide the outlet for African nationalism. And this is the betrayal of the black people, right? This is now the subjugation of black people come to get, coming together on the basis of being black due to a white ideology called socialism that tells you no hook up with white folks, right? Hold hands and then they're gonna start treating you well. Well, guess what? That didn't happen in Russia. It didn't happen in Cuba. It didn't happen anywhere, nor will it ever happen. So this is a selling out of the very black people who coined the term Pan-Africanism. 
And according to the text, it says Pan-Africanism has had its share of counterfeit adherence. For instance, it will be inferable that Nkrumah infringed on Pan-Africanism, not only in his marriage to an Arab woman, but also in his insistence that the futuristic, massive, and powerful African nation would include the Arabs among its citizenry. Nkrumah even dropped the term Pan-Africanism and replaced it with the Russian-style nomenclature all African to indicate he was starting a new tradition. And he himself said, I do not mean a big brotherhood uh, based upon a criterion of color. So he's getting rid of Black people coming together on the basis of being Black in order to hold hands with workers and whoever happens to be on the African continent, even if they are very first colonizers and slavers and imperialists, the Arabs. He's willing to marry one of them. So again, we see Nana Du Bois's advice to Nana Nkrumah. He says, Ghana must, on the contrary, be the representative of Africa, and not only that, but of Black Africa below the Sahara Desert. He says, as such, our first duty should be to come into close acquaintanceship um, with others in the areas of British West Africa, Liberia, great areas of Black folk, French West. So he's talking about Black people coming together on the basis of being Black. Now, this happened late enough in his life because he wasn't about that life when uh, he was fighting against Nana Garvey. But eventually, he came around, apparently. So he says, all the former barriers of language, culture, religion, and political control uh, should bow before the essential rate, unity of race and descent, the common suffering of slavery and the slave trade, and the modern color bar. And Ghana should lead a movement of Black men for Pan-Africanism, including periodic conferences and peer personal contacts of Black men from the Sahara to the Indian Ocean. So this is very powerful. He's basically calling for a rise in Kometsu consciousness. But that, unfortunately, that was still born in Nana Nkrumah, who just used the term Black here and there, had a Black star on the flag, but he was fighting for uh, linking with these Arabs. Now, eventually, two years before he died, he said all peoples of African descent belong to the African nation, but he still made a distinction between African revolutionary struggle and the context of the Black Revolution, right? He sees them as here's one thing that's African, it's not isolated, it's in the context of the Black Revolution. But then he's still bringing in this world socialist revolution, like we're going to be holding hands with white workers and whatever. However, we're dealing with African equals Black population and not location. So in Wolof, we say, No matter how long a log remains in the water, it never becomes a crocodile. A piece of log will never turn into a crocodile, no matter how long it remains in the river. That's to say, just because a cat has kittens in an oven, you don't call the kittens biscuits. That means African equals Black people are still African equals Black people, regardless of location. Meanwhile, pale white Arab and invaders, colonizers, and slavers are still the same, regardless of location, even if they're located on the African continent. So whereas they have the Arab lead, our way forward is that we need to have an African equals Black lead. And we shouldn't call it that, we should call it Kemet, land of black people, and we should call ourselves Kemetsu. And we should jettison even using the term African because there's no part of that word that lets us know that this land is for black people. And as long as we hold on to it, we are going to be subjected to anyone who happens to be on the continent who says, oh, well, I'm on the African continent, so I'm African. I'm North African, I'm South African, I'm this African, I'm that African. But when we say Kemetsu, then we understand that no, these are Black people. And when we call our land Kemet, it's like we do in all of these various contemporary languages. In Chi, it's Abibima, land of Black people. And Yoruba is Iladulawa, land of Black people. In Bamanakan, it's Farafina, land of Black people. And Walaf, it's Reunis Konyo, land of Black people. In Ibo, it's Ala and Dicioji, which is the land of Black people. In Kikongo, it's in Sia Bandombe, land of Black people. So in any time we conceive of this from classical times up to now, this land is the land of Black people. But as long as we refer to it as Africa, this comes into the English language through Provincia Africa Proconsularis around 146 BCE at the time of the defeat of Hatada in the uh, end of the Third Punic Wars. So what happens is Senectoke, also known as Pro Prototo, is this little thin strip of land. We're referring to the entire continent on the basis of what the Romans called their little thin strip of conquered land. So as long as we refer to our continent in the same terms as a conquered territory of Rome, we shouldn't be surprised when we're behaving like a conquered territory of Rome. But when we refer to it as Kemet, that gives us our social theory. 
for the Black Survival Thrust of This is the Land by Black People and for Black People, Kemet in Kemet you, right? In Hanu Per Hasut, that is to say, Kemet for the Black people, those at home in the interior and those on the foreign lands, on the Hasut. And that needs to be our rallying cry and our rallying call uh, into perpetuity. So in conclusion, Medamase Ashe, Alniche, Matondo Mamingi, Dwa Santinisana, Morakose, Jerengen Jefsi, Abonga Kapulu, Amasekanalu, Imela, Birepo, Anjarama, Murakose Chane, Oedifoni, Amini, Kelebo, Hakudu, Nye Waladon. Appreciate y'all. So I hope that has been helpful. This has been uh, my presentation on the classical Kometsu origins of Pan-Africanism. And this is really our rallying cry and our rallying call to throw away you know, the words of these cave beasts who say, no, it's, it's just irrigated soil and whatever, and just listen to the words of our ancestors. Text after text after text after text is about Black people coming together on the basis of being Black against our non-Black enemies. And this is the situation that we're in right now. We're in a situation similar to Lamentations of Imahu Equal Wear, where Ma'at has been subjugated. Isfet is all over the world. However, Kemet is also global, right? So we have Black people throughout the world. So we need to link together as Kemet, global Kemet. And we need to come together as Kemet's you, Black people on the basis of being Black to defeat our non-Black enemies as has happened time and time again throughout history and as will happen in the future. Madam Wassim, appreciate y'all.